Welcome. Thank you all for joining me on today's episode of the Metabolic Classroom, powered, if you will, by Insulin IQ. As we get started, let me just lay out the groundwork. So the focus for the lesson today is the uh, anti-diabetic drugs. Now you can tell from the name, um, anti-diabetic means that it's fighting the disease diabetes. Uh, but that term itself can be a little confusing. Um, but I also want to take a little time to describe the problem with most anti-diabetic drugs. And that is particularly the paradigm with which these drugs are in a way created. Um, these drugs are based on the idea of glucose being the villain. Now, I wanted to be able to, I wanted to be able to have you listen to this discussion and participate in this classroom as a student. Uh, and have in mind both type 1 and type 2 diabetes uh, because they are kind of similar, but they're also kind of different. But by keeping them both in mind, it, I actually think it becomes helpful for you to then see what I consider to be the problem. And again, namely the glucose centric paradigm. So let's just start with a, a brief overview of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Now, if I were to ask you to describe type 1 diabetes in the fewest possible words, you would say probably something like it is a disease of no insulin. Mm -hmm. And that would be absolutely right. Now, there's a little more nuance to it. And indeed, there's a little more background, namely the autoimmune aspect and the destruction of the beta cells that produce insulin. But regardless, the focus would be on um, the reduction of insulin to the point of negligible to zero and, and, and the, all the, the metabolic complications that come from that, because insulin just has such a chokehold on all things metabolic. Now, with type 2 diabetes, how would you describe it? You can't say it's a disease of no insulin because it isn't. It is never a disease of no insulin. Type 2 diabetes is never a disease of no insulin. Unfortunately, some of the language surrounding type 2 diabetes makes us think it's a disease of no insulin because you'll hear terms like insulin becomes insufficient. Well, what does that mean? That's a relative term. Insufficient for what? Well, it means in what they mean by that is it's insufficient for controlling blood sugar levels. In reality, if it's actual type 2 diabetes, insulin levels are higher than normal. It, it, if you look at insulin levels over the life of the type 2 diabetic, they have gone up and up and up and up, continued to go up. And then in some instances of type 2 diabetes, it may crest, it peaks and starts to come down, but it never goes down to zero. That's not type 2 diabetes. Now, there are rare instances called LADA, L-A-D-A, latent autoimmune diabetes of the adult, which is basically just a late onset type 1. It may be coincident that someone with type 2 diabetes develops type 1 later in life, but that's not type 2 anymore. And, uh, that's a different disease that just happens to be address, uh, focusing on or targeting the pancreas. So with type 2 diabetes, insulin never goes to zero, even though it may come down a bit. But even if it comes down and it peaks and crests and starts to drop again, as I just described, it's still multiples higher than it was before the person ever started on this in, on this journey towards type two diabetes. So if you're if you're watching me, um, then then it would go something like insulin levels are really really low. They're climbing over the life of the person year over year over year, mind you, all while glu all while glucose is staying flat. And then it comes up, and then it can start to turn and come down a bit. But even if it comes down, it's still much much higher than it is when it started, and higher than it would be. Than higher than is ideal in someone who's metabolically healthy or who has good insulin sensitivity. Now, still, however, the problem then to bring this back to the topic really is that we have lumped these diseases together because the most obvious manifestation of type 1 diabetes, which historically was the only one that really ever existed prior until about 100-ish years ago, maybe 150 or so, um, it, it was the most obvious manifestation or sign and symptom was a consequence of the high glucose, namely the excess urine production, polyuria. In fact, the term diabetes 
comes from the word of excess, this Greek term for the excessive production of urine or to flow through too quickly. The most obvious sign of diabetes classically was a result of the high glucose. And unfortunately, that view has persisted where we still look at type 2 diabetes as a disease of too much glucose, when if we had a more precise paradigm, we would view it as a disorder of too much insulin. So in that sense, it becomes the exact opposite of type 1 diabetes. Yes, they both share a tendency for hyperglycemia, but they get to that end through two totally different means. In the case of type 1 diabetes, it's because of a true deficiency of insulin. In the case of type 2 diabetes, it's because the insulin isn't working very well. In other words, insulin resistance. Now, with all of that as a framework, I don't want you to think that high glucose isn't a problem. Chronic hyperglycemia is pathogenic. It can harm the body. However, so much of what we associate with type 2 diabetes, namely the increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, the increased risk of cancer, the increased risk of heart disease and fatty liver disease, those are not problems of the hyperglycemia, but they are problems of the hyperinsulinemia, the high insulin and the associated insulin resistance. So just remember that. Um, the, the final point before going further is that uh, if you have a glucose-centric paradigm, in other words, if your sole focus when you look at the person with diabetes is to lower the glucose at all costs, then you don't care what insulin is doing. And remember, I just got done describing how so much of the pathologies associated with type 2 diabetes in particular are a consequence of the insulin resistance, not the hyperglycemia. So it's the, it's the insulin resistance. So again, if you are trying to lower glucose and to do so you are increasing insulin, and because why not? After all, you have a glucose-centric paradigm. The conventional clinical view would say that's worth it. It's good. Let's lower glucose at all costs. Then you'd be fine with it. And unfortunately, there are consequences to that perspective that are disastrous. Metformin is the most widely prescribed anti-diabetic drug on the planet for two reasons. One, it's cheap. It's off patent. And two, it works. Despite it being the most commonly used anti-diabetic drug, it's actually, of all the ones we're going to go through today, the least understood. Um, but the main theme of metformin is that it acts by targeting the mitochondria. So that's the main mechanism of action. Now, this is where things do get confusing because some publications will find that it actually acts by improving mitochondrial function. Uh, and, and one of the metrics of doing this in a workhorse tool in my own lab is measuring what's called mitochondrial respiration, or basically how much are the mitochondria breathing? How much are they taking in oxygen? Um, and the purpose of the oxygen is to fuel the flames of metabolism to create energy for the cell in the form of ATP. But the mitochondria are the focus of metformin. But again, the confusion being, is it actually improving mitochondrial function or is it compromising mitochondrial function. I was a co-author on a paper, so I lean this way because we did some of the work, suggesting that metformin actually compromises mitochondria. And by disrupting one of the electron transport complexes, and I'm, I'm getting more specific than I intended, you're actually inhibiting or, or compromising the mitochondria's ability to burn fuel in order to create ATP as the cellular energy. In so, doing the, in so doing, reducing ATP, you end up activating an enzyme called AMPK. And AMPK is an ultimate kind of catabolic master switch. It wants the cell to start burning energy. So if AMPK is activated, glycolysis goes up, so the cell starts using more glucose. And lipolysis and beta oxidation of fats go up, so you start burning more fat for fuel. So metformin ends up having all of these generally favorable metabolic outcomes. In fact, metformin, and this is ironic in light of what we're going to get to in just a moment, is sometimes referred to as an exercise mimetic. So it's sometimes described as a drug that can mimic the effects of exercise. This means that metformin will have two general effects that have been pretty well documented. One is that it reduces the liver's production of or, or breakdown of glycogen. And, and gluconeogenesis. So in other words, it's stopping or slowing or inhibiting the liver's 
production or output of glucose, which is a good thing. That's going to reduce blood glucose levels, which helps insulin come down. And then speaking of insulin, there's evidence to suggest that muscle, which by mass is the main insulin sensitive, insulin dependent tissue in the body, the muscle becomes more insulin sensitive directly. Let's talk about the consequences. So one of the most obvious consequences to someone on metformin is the, is the bubbling in the tummy, if you will, the nausea and the GI distress, some nausea and diarrhea. Um, that's the generally main symptom. But then the mitochondria-specific effects are relevant. There are multiple papers to show that, especially as we age, if people are on metformin, metformin is directly blunting the body's favorable adaptation to exercise, whether it is aerobic or resistance. So there are studies in humans to show that metformin blunts the mitochondrial adaptations to endurance exercise. So if someone is running or engaging in any kind of aerobic activity, normally you would expect their mitochondria to get better and stronger because of that activity. Metformin stops that. It blunts that from happening. Additionally, there's evidence in older humans to find that uh, metformin blunts the muscle adaptation, the muscle protein synthesis, the growing and strengthening of muscle tissue in response to in, uh, resistance exercise. Uh, so uh, I find it particularly amusing that these longevity gurus, and I do mean to kind of have that dripping with sarcasm and a little disrespect, um, that a lot of these people who have become experts, if you will, in longevity, an area in which you cannot be an expert because there's no human um, trials to support that. Um, they, In one breath, they'll be advocating metformin, and then in the other, they're advocating exercise. Those two don't go together nicely. Okay, so that's it for metformin, the most widely used drug. I guess if I were to put a summary statement on this, and I didn't intend to say this, so we'll see how it comes out. Um, my view of metformin is generally favorable if you don't exercise. If you can exercise, then do, and, and then be a little more wary of the metformin. All right. Now, the next one of the next most common interventions for diabetes is insulin therapy itself. Now, of course, insulin therapy is critical and life-saving for people with type 1 diabetes, but it ends up being life threatening, if you will, and someone with type 2 diabetes, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Of course, the, the justification now and the rest of the conversation will be framed in the context of type 2 diabetes, um, and generally is, unless I say otherwise. Um, the view with insulin, the justification for insulin therapy in type 2 diabetes is based totally on the glucose-centric paradigm, that if your view of type 2 diabetes is that we need to lower glucose at all costs, then you would say, why not? Let's give them an insulin syringe and have them shoot that insulin straight into their veins to lower their glucose, and it will lower their glucose. But unfortunately, there are complications. But before I get into that, some, there are lots of different types of insulin, rapid acting, short acting, long acting. Um, some of the long acting, which are the more common ones, they have the, they end with the term arginine or gene as a suffix at the end of some of the drug classes. So you'll like glargine. Um, they are, uh, these are drugs that are, well, they're, they're insulin. They come into the body and they're just going to act like insulin. And so no surprise that um, there's a risk of reducing your blood sugar a little too quickly. So hypoglycemia is a common concern. Of course, we've talked previously about body fat changes. It's no surprise that the moment you put a diabetic type 1 or type 2 on insulin therapy, they're going to gain fat mass. They're going to gain weight, and that will mostly be fat. A fascinating study was published out of Japan a number of years ago that looked at insulin injection sites. You've heard before that if you're if there's a diabetic on insulin therapy, they need to rotate their injection sites. The reason for this is that insulin promotes the growth of fat cells so well that they will end up getting these exaggerated fat blobs um, in their body. So the study out of Japan actually conducted a biopsy of the fat, and they measured the fat at the site of the injection where the body had kind of gotten this little bulb of fat. And then they measured a fat biopsy just a few centimeters away at a site that was still in the same overall fat depot 
but not getting the direct injection of insulin. And they found that the fat cells were about 10 times bigger by volume at the site of the insulin injection. I mean, it's just absolute proof positive of insulin's effect on fat cells and ultimately promoting growth. Now, beyond the inconvenience of gaining weight, there are true um, dis chronic disease concerns, all of which has been shown admittedly through correlational studies in humans. Um, but the first is a heart disease risk that insulin therapy in type 2 diabetes is associated with an in increased heart uh, cardiovascular risk. And there's this dose-dependent association. So the more insulin someone has to inject in order to keep their glucose in check, which is to say another way, the more insulin resistant you are, and now you're pushing your insulin up to these almost super physiological levels, um, then the more likely you are to die from heart disease. And this is directly contributing to hypertension, dyslipidemia, atherosclerosis, and more. So uh, again, um, giving the type 2 diabetic insulin is going to increase their risk of heart disease. There's also an increased risk of cancer. Now, I speak about cancer very, very delicately because there's so much we don't understand about cancer. But once again, there's this dose-dependent risk that as insulin dose requirements are going up in the type 2 diabetic, so too does the risk of cancer mortality. And then third and final is a risk of Alzheimer's disease, that there's evidence to suggest that if you put a type 2 diabetic on insulin therapy, the risk of Alzheimer's disease goes up. There's a couple different studies that have been published on that topic over the past couple decades.